Absolutely. There we go. Okay, so good afternoon, um, everyone. We are going to go ahead and get started um, with our webinar today. Uh, my name is Courtney Wheeler. I am one of the public health program managers here at the National Indian Health Board. And today we have with us Dr. Tara Henning from the CDC. There's a few things I would like to go over um, before we get started with her presentation. So as many of you may know, the National Indian Health Board is a nonprofit organization that was started um, over 40 years ago on behalf of the tribes. So we serve the federally recognized tribes and we advocate on several issues related to health and public health, as well as programmatic work um, across Indian country. Um, so some of the services we provide are policy analysis, um, communication to tribes, um, technical assistance, and a host of other things. Um, just an agenda for how um, this afternoon will go. Um, we'll do the welcome and introduction. We'll have some housekeeping, which I'll go over next. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the upcoming um, learning community webinars we have, and then we'll proceed to Dr. Henning's presentation, and there'll be some time at the end for a Q&A. So just a reminder um, to please keep your microphones or telephones on mute um, during the presentation. You can use the chat box for questions or comments um, throughout the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and the slides and recordings will be available um, in a few days on our website. We will um, do an announcement so people know where to find them on the webpage. And again, at the end will be the Q&A. Um, so we do have some upcoming um, learning community webinars after this one. So August 19th, we have one on the basics of planning for an infectious disease outbreak, which will be at three o'clock. Um, there'll be an announcement made when registration is available for that one. And we also have one September 15th on crisis standards of care, which will also be at three o'clock. Um, when registration is available, we will again do an announcement. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Henning. Um, so she can begin her presentation. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. All right, so hi everybody. I'm gonna switch over to the right screen and if I can get Courtney to give me a confirmation that you can see my slides there. Yes, I see them. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Well, hi everybody. So as Courtney mentioned, we're gonna do a little bit of the microbiology basics and one hour is not a lot of time to cover microbiology. So. I say that I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the skinny on microbes and most importantly, maybe talk about their impact on public health. Um, so I, Courtney had begun there to introduce me and so I'll, I'll go ahead and put it here, just put basic name in case your screen is oriented where um, you may not be able to see my face. This is, a, this is the person that's talking to you. I am from CDC. I'm the lead of a laboratory uh, fellowship program at CDC called Laboratory Leadership Service or LLS. We are a sister program to the EIS uh, program, which some of you may know about. I'm also an adjunct instructor with Georgia State University and I've been teaching with them for close to 10 years now. I teach undergraduate biology and microbiology. Now I plan for this to be a pretty interactive uh, session. Uh, we've got a, a good solid group where we can have, actually have a little bit of fun. Looks like there's about 16 or so with us, um, which means we can unmute, we can talk, and um, I might even encourage you to unmute in some things as opposed to enter, take the time to enter into the chat box. So this is exciting. What I want to do is have you grab a device. That could be the device that you're already on. Um, just make sure you have a window up on your computer. Um, or you may want to grab your phone, but at some point in this talk, we're going to go to menti, M-E-N-T-I dot com and do a little activity. So have that available, be ready for that when we get to it. And as I mentioned, we're, we're aiming for interactive here. So I would love for you guys to share with me something that you hope to gain from this webinar. And if you want to use the chat box, you can. If you just want to unmute and say it out loud, since there's not a ton of us here, that's okay too. Maybe Courtney has a preference. She might want that into, into the chat so that it's recorded. Um, I'm going to pull up the chat where I can see it. But go ahead, type something in. What do you expect to gain from this webinar? I'd love to hear from you. And full disclosure, if you are joining just so that you can get CEUs, that's okay. And I can relate. <laughs> I will not take that personally. 
All right, Ricky is joining us from um, New Mexico. I see some folks from uh, Havasu. Anyone have anything they want to share from what they hope to gain? All right, last call. I'm going to pull some interaction out of you guys before we leave here. Okay, well, just to give um, a little bit of an overview on our learning objectives, this is what I'm setting out to, to teach you or to go over with you today. And we've got five learning objectives, what may seem like a, a big bite, um, but we wanna look at some of the differences between what I call the big four, uh, bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites. Um, I wanna talk about uh, factors on both sides of the fence, both on the microbe and on the host side that would make it easier to cause disease in a person. I'd like us to talk a little bit about disease spread. I think that that's pretty important nowadays. There's a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of terms that are being used interchangeably. I'd like to talk about that. And at the end, we will summarize uh, ways that we can reduce or control the spread of microbial disease. All right, so first up, I have a little poll. And so Courtney has uploaded these. She's gonna help us um, uh, execute these polls, but I'd love to know what your level of understanding is of microbiology. And so some of the options here are A, I think I took that class in college. Like maybe you remember some of that. I think um, some of us may have had, or most of us may have had some sort of microbiology coursework in our career. B, I could probably explain to you why you don't treat a cold with antibiotics, which is an important thing to know. C, etiologic agents and disease spread are my jam. Like you love this stuff, you know about it, what bugs cause what disease. Or D, you've got a lot of experience in this area and just call me Dr. Micro and I even hear the mic drop, right? And Courtney, I am not able to see the polls coming up. So if you see that, um, one moment, it looks like. Oh, there we go. I can, I launched the poll. There we okay. go. Things are frozen thought, on my end, so I'm going to get that together and I will be able to. Okay, well, I can do that now. All right, so, oh, I've got 15 folks out there. Awesome. Okay. Ooh, I like somebody. They said disease spread is their jam. This is great. It kind of looks like we're settling more in that middle area, which is great. This is this um, webinar is designed to, it's designed in mind with somebody who's had some sort of experience or training. Um, and what my goal here is, is that I'm not gonna teach you everything about microbiology. We couldn't do that in an hour, but I hope to sort of refresh some of your previous learning. Um, I love the fact that we do have somebody that says etiologic agents and disease spread are my jam. Thank you. We are gonna be fast friends. Um, but I want you to be able to walk away with, if you can walk away with at least two new pieces of information, or at least two things that you can say, huh, okay, that, that's really interesting, then I would call that this a success, particularly if that's something that you can apply into your daily life. So it um, looks like the, the majority of us are falling into that. I could probably explain to you why you don't um, treat uh, a cold with antibiotics. And then, of course, because it's a virus. Um, and that requires some level of understanding about the difference between bacteria and viruses. All right, let's move on. And I think it's important to at least start right at the beginning and talk about what is a microbe. Um, these guys are going to be very small, minute organisms, which you probably already knew that. Most of them can't see with the unaided eye. You need a microscope. And the big question that you know people have is, are microbes good or bad, friend or foe? And the resounding response to that question is they're awful, they're terrible, they make us sick. People are dying left and right from microbial infections. And particularly nowadays, that, that's really gonna be our, our knee jerk response. And that's okay, except that most microbes are actually friendly. Um, marine and freshwater microbes, they make up the bottom of our ocean food chain. And, and a lot of us benefit from that, even if you don't eat seafood. Um, many of the microorganisms have commercial applications, such as the production of vitamins. Fun fact, during World War I, microorganisms were actually exploited and used as a key factor in producing a smokeless gunpowder called carbide that was used in their artillery rounds. So that's kind of neat. A vast number of our antibiotics are produced from bacteria and fungi. So that's an interesting little paradox there. In fact, penicillin was first found growing on a grapefruit. 
Uh, it's derived from the fungus penicillium. And the penicillium, the fungus, was found on a grapefruit. Several soil bacteria, particularly from the genus of, excuse me, um, particularly from the genus uh, Streptomyces, are um, actually produce antimicrobial compounds. And, and we've kind of exploited this little neat trick for several for the mass production of several clinically relevant um, antibiotic antimicrobial compounds, like neomycin in our antibiotic ointments, um, streptomycin, even chloramphenicol, even though that's not such a mainstream drug anymore. And then there's the food industry. How many of you guys have an adult beverage from time to time? You drink beer or wine and, you know, I'll be the first to say sometimes I enjoy one of those, but beer wouldn't be beer without yeast. And uh, most of which is derived from the fungus Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Wine is also made with um, cerevisiae, but also with the lactic acid production from bacteria such as lactobacillus. That may ring a bell and you're like, hey, I know that that's in my yogurt or that's a key normal flora in the genital compartment. Um, it's just a lot to consider about microbes that's not just infectious disease. And I like to start out with that perspective. So there are several groups or classes of microorganisms. And if you were in my class, we'd dive into all of these with great detail, but not today. I do want to hit some of the high points of the medically relevant ones. Um, so we're going to look at bacteria, fungi, um, viruses, animal pro, uh, and animal parasites. Um, also, you know, one of the things I enjoy most about microbiology is learning about all of the, the different diseases and, and which bugs cause them. And that's a whole semester's content, right? Um, so we can't really do that too much, but I'm going to take the opportunity as much as I can to weave in some of the, the etiology. First up, let's look at some of those classes that was falling under that first learning objective. Um, bacteria. When most people think micro, this is what they're thinking of. Um, it's a, a close runner up being viruses. These guys are single celled prokaryotic organisms. You probably remember a few details about prokaryotes from some of your earlier courses. Um, but just a reminder that these cell types don't have a nucleus. They don't have any membrane bound organelles on the inside. Um, that's a serious Cliff Notes version uh, description, but they, um, they have cell walls. And the majority of those cell walls is going to be made up of a, a sugar structure called peptidoglycan. Now, you probably noticed the asterisk there. There are some exceptions, particularly with the respect to, say, mycobacterium species. Uh, that's the causative agent of tuberculosis and other related diseases. Um, their walls are primarily made of mycolic acid. Or you have mycoplasma, which is the etiologic agent or one of the etiologic agents of walking pneumonia. They have sterols in uh, their um, cell walls, kind of similar to what we might find in some of our plasma membranes. So hence the asterisk, there's always an asterisk in science, but for the most part, and for the sake of this conversation, we're gonna think about bacteria having that peptidoglycan cell wall structure. They also have distinctive shapes. Um, they can be bacillus, so rod shaped, the green picture there at the top. They can be coccyx or spherical, that kind of purpley picture there on the bottom. And, those are arranged in you know, clusters or chains, even spiral shaped there in the middle. That's actually a picture of Treponema pallidum, the etiologic agent of syphilis. We can exploit the differences in cell wall morphology, even the amount of peptidoglycan that's in the cell wall, whether or not there's an outer membrane around that cell wall. We can exploit all these differences to help us with identification, antibiotic treatments, the choice of a disinfectant or um, have a better understanding of microbial spread. So for fungi, um, it's a plural of fungus, um, this is another group and, and these guys are different. They are eukaryotic, meaning they do have a nucleus. They do have all the goodies inside those, those uh, membrane bound organelles, um, which we're gonna review a little bit in a second. They also have cell walls, but you won't find peptidoglycan here. Instead, there's a compound called chitin. Um, so fungi are a lot bigger than bacteria. Some species can be seen without the use of a microscope. Case in point, the giant mushroom there in the middle picture, the slime mold at the bottom. Um, but you know, at the top, you are gonna have some microscopic species, but you don't need to use such a high magnification in order to see those. So fun fact about fungi, um, most pathogenic fungi exhibit something we call dimorphism. So look at that top picture there. That's the same organism. On the left-hand side, it's in a mold form. That means it's at room temperature. 
But when you put that organism in a body temperature, so you raise the temperature, right? It's going to start to hyphate because it's going to switch gears because it knows it's in an environment where it can um, execute some of its virulence factors. It's going to start to replicate and spread. And so then it um, shifts into more of a yeast form when it starts to hyphate. So pathogenic fungi exist in a dimorphic state. Uh, molds at room temperature, yeasts at body temperature. Not a lot of people know that. So that might be one of the things you take away. Another group is protozoans. These guys are fun. Um, they are eukaryotes, but they are motile. ones. So they move around and we actually subclass them based on how they move. Um, you got a few different options. You can have um, pseudopods. Take a look at that middle picture. Um, pseudopods actually means Latin for false feet. They can move by long flagella, uh, and like in the top picture, or they can, uh, and when they have those, they have sort of like a tumble and run type fertility, um, or they can use little cilia, um, which will allow them to either swim along or push along a surface. Okay, I discussed these three key types of motility. And I feel uh, beholden to tell you that for one of the most clinically relevant protozoans, which would be the plasmodium uh, genus, plasmodium species um, cause malaria. They don't use any of these. <laughs> they, uh, they have a unique form of locomotion called gliding motility. Some people call it sort of like a stick and flips or a shuffle. Um, so it's something completely different, right? Um, again, there's that science, scientific asterisk. Um, an interesting example of um, pseudopod motility would be an amoeba. Um, I'll use the example of a freshwater um, protozoan amoeba, Nigleria phalari. Some of you may know this one. It's one of the brain-eating amoebas. And I raise this as an example, as another example of that asterisk. It's a double whammy. It has an amoeba, but it can also develop a flagella under certain circumstances that would allow it to move to more favorable conditions perhaps up the nasal cavity of a swimmer. So a lot of neat things here. Maybe we'll take just a second and talk about some of the other motility things. So that picture at the top, the flagellated one, that's actually Trichomonas vaginalis, etiologic agent of trick. Um, there are um, some pretty common, the majority of your protozoans are gonna have some sort of flagella, whether that's their primary mode of uh, motility, but Giardia, the trypanosomas like T. cruzi. Um, the agent that causes amoebic dysentery into amoeba histolytica. I also want to share as a fun fact, you know, I gave you that example of the cilia. We haven't talked about it yet. Um, Valentidium coli. It's the only ciliated protozoan that we know of that actually causes in, uh, disease in humans. It's a zoonotic disease. It's transmitted from swine, usually through contaminated water sources. And it, it causes a, a mild GI upset. Oftentimes it's mild, could be asymptomatic. So we go through all this trouble of explaining ciliated motility, and it really only applies to one protozoan in terms of humans. All right, in addition to bacteria, viruses are going to top the list of recognition when it comes to microbes, particularly since our world has been at the mercy of one for a while. Um, these guys are super small. So small, in fact, that you cannot see them with a regular compound microscope. You have to use very specialized, translation extensive, uh, scopes that either like a scanning electron or a transmission electron microscope in order to see individual virions. Technically, these guys are neither eukaryotic nor prokaryotic. And if you had to pick one, though, lean towards the prokaryotic end of that spectrum. They can have an outside, um, outside coating, which we call an envelope, or they can be naked. Generally, naked viruses are going to be a little hardier when they're out in the environment, when they're outside of their host cell, because they're less susceptible to changes in humidity, to drying. Um, this isn't a hard and fast rule, but for the most part. Um, envelope viruses are that way because they bud out from their host cell, and they actually steal a little bit of that host cell membrane with it to cover themselves. This gives them an advantage in terms of their ability to evade immune responses. Um, one, they kind of look like that cell now. Two, they now have an envelope that they can use to fold in on itself and change the way it might look at the immune response. So these guys are pretty cool. We're going to talk about that in a little bit more. Uh, viruses are what we call intracellular obligate parasites or obligate intracellular parasites, either way. They must have a host to live, reproduce, and spread. 
That's not to say that they can't live and persist for a limited amount of time outside the host, but there's a statute of limitations on that. Whatever that time frame is, it depends on the virus, but it certainly cannot replicate and it cannot spread. They have to be inside the cell because they don't have any machinery to do their own replication themselves. They hijack that from the, cell, from the host cell. So it kind of makes sense if you keep them out of the cells, you keep out, you stop transmission and you know, stop transmission, the infection and the spread will eventually die out and stop. We know, obviously, that this is easier said than done, uh, but that is the prevailing underlying microbiologic principle. And then the last but not the least are the worms. These are a favorite in my classes. They're kind of a favorite of mine because they're so oogie. Um, they're generally eukaryotic. There are a few exceptions, but for the purpose of this webinar, we're gonna consider them a, a eukaryotic class. Um, and we're talking about helmets. Um, they are, the helmets that are medically relevant are gonna be parasitic worms. When we see parasitic worms, most people immediately gravitate towards tapeworms. And that's a great association. Tapeworms are really cool. They have interesting structures and scolexes and almost like teeth that help them attach to our intestinal cell walls or tools with which to burrow through our muscles. These guys are really cool. Um, a, a helmet that's gonna fall into two different categories, like a roundworm, which we also know as nematode, that's there on the left, and then a flatworm, um, which is on the right. The flatworms that cause disease in humans are usually referred to as flukes, and they're named such, named that such on where they're causing the disease, like a, a liver fluke, a brain fluke, a blood fluke. There in that picture is an example of a blood fluke. It's actually a Schistosoma mansoni. And if you look, that thing is big, right? A little bit over an inch and a half, and it's in your bloodstream. So you can kind of think about, this also parlays into some of what um, helmets main, you know, their main levels of pathogenicity, it's not that they themselves are terribly virulent, but they are pathogenic because they're so big and they cause obstructions within our bodies. Um, some truly disturbing images associated with helmets infections. Um, I regret we don't have more time to, to dive into these. Speaking of diving, I do wanna do a little bit more of a, a deeper dive into um, that eukaryotic prokaryotic, prokaryotic question and then talk about bacterial cell walls a little bit. So eukaryotic versus prokaryotic. You got eukaryotic here on the left, multi-chromosomal DNA, it's inside a nucleus, there are other membrane-bound organelles there, um, you know, lots of structures. You can just look at this picture and see it's a very complex cell. These guys are gonna divide and replicate by mitosis. In contrast, we take a look at the left-hand, or the right-hand side, and that's a bacterial cell, a prokaryotic cell. They have a single circular DNA chromosome. There are no histones that help package that thing together in a nucleus. There's no nucleus. There's no membrane bound organelles. Um, they have a cell wall. Um, eukaryotic cells can, can have one, they cannot have one, it's fine. Um, most of the cell walls, as we discussed, are made of peptidoglycan. And these guys are gonna replicate by binary fission, meaning they're, you've got one cell and then they're just gonna split, pull apart, and then do that over and over again. You can look at this and see the difference in complexity. And I love this because think about how much damage something so simply constructed can cause. And I just think that that's fascinating and, and the level of respect that we need to have for these organisms. So also with bacteria, we're thinking about this. Um, I mentioned there are important key exceptions like with TB, but in general, we can classify bacteria as either gram positive or gram negative. And that's an important distinction when it comes to identification, choosing an antibiotic treatment, cleaning strategies, considering antibiotic resistance, et cetera, even the clinical presentation of some of the diseases. So I wanted to take a second and, and look at this. So on the, uh, on the right, you've got gram positive and immediately you're gonna hone in on those thick layers of that purple, right? And that's your peptidoglycan. On the left-hand side is your gram negative, where we have much fewer peptidoglycan layers. And you're thinking, this is awesome. That sucker's gonna break. Not so, because it's protected by an outer membrane. That's that um, structure on the very top. And that outer membrane contains porins or little holes, other channels that will literally pump back out antibiotics. It contributes to the high um, antibiotic resistance nature of these organisms. It really dictates and limits things we can use for a disinfectant. 
And I also want to draw your attention to those little green spikes. That's lipopolysaccharide or LPS. And at the end of that is a toxin. And that's also what contributes to the pathogenicity and the virulence of, of these organisms. Um, so you can think that, yes, they may have only a thin layer of peptidoglycan, but they're covered in a really well-constructed um, covering of an outer membrane and then literally spiked with toxin. Okay, time to switch gears. Let's talk a little bit less about the intricacies of the bug and more about that interplay with the host. I want to talk a minute about the relationship between microbes and human disease. Also remind you, not all microbes are bad. In fact, we have tons of microorganisms in and on our bodies, our normal flora or normal microbiota. They're supposed to be there. You know, our body has a whole slew of natural defenses. And one of the primary ones is our normal flora. It's established right at birth. It, uh, it grows with exposure to food, air, et cetera. Um, it can be a little transient at times, but you know, it's always there. In fact, there are about 10 times more bacterial cells in our body than there actually are human body cells. I like that little piece of trivia. And of course, there are several factors that can, you know, affect the concentration of these, right? pH, antibiotic use, diet, et cetera. Um, they compete with the bad bugs for space and nutrients. They regulate pH, particularly in the female genital compartment. They produce important vitamins. So these, these guys are pretty important. There's also a balance that dictates when one of those friend bacteria could become a foe. And that depends on our level of resistance to infection. Are we healthy? Are we elderly? Are we stressed? Are we tired? The normal flora isn't the only factor in that resistance. There's factors in our daily lives that affect our susceptibility. Things that we can't even control, like us poor ladies that have the shorter urethras that make us more susceptible to UTIs. Um, genetic predisposition for, say, sickle cell disease or other autoimmune disorders. Chemotherapy, even climate and weather. Frankly, our lifestyle. All of these can't be ignored. All of these affect our disposition and predisposition to a disease and infection. Um, so if there's no balance of normal flora, our resistance is low, the likelihood of infection is going to be higher. It may not necessarily even be the result of a truly pathogenic bacteria, but here's where we get into that concept of opportunistic infection. And that's usually due to a disruption in the normal flora. Several opportunistic infection or opportunistic pathogens are already present in our bodies, like streptococcus pneumoniae, Neisseria meningitidis. Yes, it is a normal flora. Um, Candida albicans, thrush in the mouth, vaginitis in the genital compartment, E. coli. Normally, these don't cause disease, but when that balance is upset, then they have the opportunity to do so. Now, in terms of host defenses, I am purposely glossing over the very large concept of the immune system and the immune response. That's more than we can talk about today. We'll touch on some little bits, but we just can't really dive into it. You know, we consider the situation from the host angle, but what about from the bug's point of view? And as a microbiologist, I kind of found, find this a little more interesting. Um, when we think about pathogenicity and virulence, these are some of those terms that we tend to use interchangeably, and that's okay, but there is a distinction between them. Um, pathogenicity is just the ability of a microbe to cause disease by overcoming the host defenses. How virulent something is means how pathogenic can it be? Um, essentially, how much trouble can this bug cause? Um, that's just some microbiology trivia for you. And again, they have to get past the host defenses. In the last slide, we talked about that balance of friend and foe with the normal flora. You know, our skin and mucous membranes are our first line of defense, followed by our innate immunity. Then we have adaptive immunity, which of course can be supplemented with vaccination. And, you know, I, I actually think we take for granted that first line of defense, the intact skin, the ciliary, ciliary elevator in our respiratory system, just the basic um, flushing action of the lacrimal apparatus in our eyes. All of these contribute to our host defenses. Um, so when you think about it, we are pretty tough cookies. It's just that some of these bugs have unique virulence factors that increase their pathogenicity, increase their virulence, such that our defenses can become overcome or challenged pretty easily. I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about virulence factors. We can't cover them all, but I'll touch on some high points. Hopefully it will pique your interest um, for further reading and discovery. Okay, 
here's another poll. So Courtney, if you want to do that, or maybe if you want to bring it up, I can help launch it. Um, so I want to, which do you think is most effective virulence factor? Um, so you got A, the ability of a bacterium to produce enzymes that allow spread through tissues. B, a virus's ability to change or mask the proteins on its surface so it can avoid the immune response. C, toxins produced by bacteria. They cause fever, cardiovascular, GI disruption, maybe even multi-organ failure. Or D, a viruses, uh, viruses that can directly kill or lice host cells. Which do you think would be the most effective? I see we are totally in a virus frame of mind, right? Everybody is clicking on B. This is interesting. All right, spoiler alert, there's no right answer. All of these are important. I just think it's kind of fun to think about and you can pick your favorite. Um, okay, great. All right. Most people have responded. All right, it seems like we're pretty interested in that virus's ability to avoid an immune response. Awesome. Okay, well, I'm going to end the polling there. I will share the results. Here we go. Um, so very cool. We're going to walk through all of these here in the next slide. Get this off my task here. Okay. So thinking, um, let's start with, uh, with the toxins. And, and a virulence factor that we didn't touch on before is the ability of a bacteria to form biofilms. So like these sticky bacterial communities, you can find them on teeth, catheters, rocks, surgical implants, contact lenses, um, anything that's gonna help them stick to a surface and they become this really effective community and they keep everybody out. It's that click at the high school lunchroom table. Maybe the exact opposite of that is when they produce toxins and enzymes that allow them to spread. Um, so strep pyogenes or streptococcus pyogenes and staphylococcus aureus, or staph aureus, they're gonna produce kinases that break down the very products that our immune system put in to wall off the infection. So they break down fibrin and clots, and then those bugs spread and, and wreak more havoc. There's hyaluronidase. It breaks down hyaluronic acid. Say that five times fast. Um, but that's an agent that helps bind connective tissues together. And so you can imagine when a bug has the ability to break that down, it's going to help the bug spread. You most often see this in wound infections, like that one that's on the right in this image. Um, it's the agent that, that, uh, that causes that blackening you see around the, the side of that wound. Um, it's particularly common in Clostridium perfringens infections, which is gas gangrene, but also in staph and strep wound infections too. And then there's um, uh, collagenase, that's an easy one. It breaks down collagen. Um, it's actually produced as an exotoxin. And we're gonna talk about that terminology in the next couple of slides. Um, the example I'm sharing here is the one that's on the left. This again is with Clostridium perfringens. This is a gas grain, uh, a gangrene wound infection. So we're breaking down collagen. It's a key component in the connective tissue. And that literally helps the bacteria spread through the tissue. It also quickens the rate of tissue necrosis. When you break down the collagen, you end up with these boils and what I say amounts to tissue soup for lack of a better term. Um, but particularly in the case of gangrene, the etiologic agent, Clostridium, it's an anaerobic bacterium. It does not like oxygen. So that quick rate of tissue necrosis is depleting the oxygen from the tissues, from, um, from that skin, and, and that also helps the bacteria thrive. So it's sort of a one-two punch there. Oh, let's see. I'm gonna come back to that. I see I've messed up my slides. <laughs> So in general, toxins are poisonous substances. Um, the, the kicker is um, that they are easily transported through the body, uh, through blood and lymphatics. It could be released in one spot, say at the site of infection, and, and then it'll spread quickly for systemic effects, but without the actual bacterial infection spreading systemically. Um, the impact that a toxin has depends on the type of toxin, the amount that rele that's released, and then of course, any pre-existing immunity you might have. Keep in mind, for some toxins, we should have been immunized with a toxoid, um, like for diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus. Symptoms with these could be mild. You could have a fever or rash. It could be relatively self-limited or to the very extreme, um, where you have severe uh, 
fevers, uh, rapid drops in blood pressure to the point where shock is induced, rapid necrosis or desquamation of the tissues, diarrhea to the point where it becomes difficult to maintain a sustaining level of hydration, or in some cases, multi-organ failure. Um, I'll note that toxemia is the presence of toxins in the blood, which is actually a true intoxication. Um, there are four types, um, an exotoxin, endotoxin, super antigen, and a membrane disrupting. I'm going to focus on the first three. So exotoxins are released by a bacterium, uh, or they can be released, they can be secreted or released during lysis. They can be harmful even in small amounts, and that kind of helps to explain that phenomenon we see where it gets worse before it gets better once you initiate treatment. It's because you're releasing all the toxin that was already there. Um, these aren't one and done either. They can act over and over again, so they're really tricky to get under control. You'll almost always find exotoxins associated with gram-positive bacterial infections, whereas endotoxins, those are gram-negative. And we talked about that. Think about those green spikes that were on the, along the outer membrane. Um, it's part of the LPS. It is not secreted. Usually it's just released after the bacteria dies or is lysed. So you, again, you have that same effect once you initiate treatment. These are nasty bees. They cause fever, usually at high levels. They cause hypotension, which can lead to shock, and in many cases, uh, DIC, or disseminated intravascular coagulation. And that creates the potential for multi-organ failure if the patient became septic. And then we just end up getting endotoxic shock. That's a term that some of us have heard before, and, and now you can kind of understand how that all works together. And then last, I wanted to touch on the super antigen. You know, I find these guys fascinating. Um, they manipulate, they exploit the immune response. They cause non-specific, un, often unregulated responses. Um, our immune system is really great. It targets itself and focuses in um, on the task at hand, but then a super antigen is gonna turn all of that upside down. Um, you get this non-specific, unregulated response and we get what's called a, a cytokine storm. Um, that, and it's, this isn't just limited to uh, toxins. SARS-CoV-2 is also capable of causing those cytokine storms. But with this, um, the symptoms can be as severe and as deadly as endotoxic shock. Um, so let's go back to these images and, and touch on a few examples. Um, the beds that you see here are cholera beds. Uh, luckily, we don't see this much uh, in developed countries, but um, this image was for Katy after the earthquake in 2010 when cholera ran rampant. Cholera is facilitated by an exotoxin, the cholera toxin, uh, and it causes the irreversible activation of an enzyme that regulates the passage of water and electrolytes through the cell. It goes haywire, and so all you get is this massive efflux of water and electrolytes out of the cell, which destroys the cell, causes tissue fragments to displace, and you end up what's called a rice water stool. You get this watery stool that's just kind of white and purulent and it has little bits of tissue that look like rice in it. Um, so much diarrhea that at some point it often becomes easier to treat the patient by putting a bucket, a graduated bucket under the patient where you can measure how much diarrhea or fluid comes out and then replace that with fluid replacement therapy until the antibiotics have a chance to get the bacteria under control. Um, there are other exotoxins, um, tetanus, botulism, whooping cough. All of these are well-known diseases that are caused by exotoxins. Um, the top right image there is the effect of an endotoxin. In addition to the fever, the drop in blood pressure, this person also had constricted blood flow um, to the extremities because of the, the DIC, the um, coagulation. That reduced blood flow then reduced the level of oxygen and it caused tissue necrosis. The bottom image is the scarlatina toxin. We also know it as the erythrogenic toxin. It's produced by select strains of streptococcus pyogenes. They have to have the gene to express that toxin. Thank goodness it's not in all of them or all our strep throats would end terribly. Um, but this, this toxin uh, releases the effects of cytokines. Um, they, don't always, they, don't, uh, they not only cause the high fever that we see in scarlet fever, but they damage the capillary system under the skin such that you get that characteristic rash and then that really painful strawberry tongue. Um, perhaps be a well -known, more well-known uh, example of a super antigen is Staph aureus food poisoning. I've hit it several times, and the only thing I can say is thank goodness it's one of those milder, and yes, you say mild with 
staph aureus food poisoning, but it's self-limiting. You know, that's only about four to six hours where you think you just, you know, want somebody to come put you out of your misery. But it acts on the vagus nerve, and that's what helps stimulate all those super fun symptoms. I want to go back real quick because, ah, here we go. I messed up my slide order. I want to make sure that we talk about them. Um, so let's get a little more savvy. We can talk about antigenic variation. This was one that you all were pretty interested in in the, uh, in the poll. It's a really smart virulent factor. So again, the immune system recognizes antigens or proteins that are on the surface of invading pathogens, and that's what triggers the immune response, and it builds a response um, specific to that, and it eliminates the pathogen. Most of the time, this works pretty well. Um, in the poll, I gave the example of a virus that can alter its proteins on the surface. Um, it's not specific just to viruses. Bacteria do it too, but this process is called antigenic variation where the bug either changes its surface protein or it changes what proteins are available or visible to the immune response. Um, so one of the back, classic bacteria that does this is Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, it has a capsule and it can change and fold and it makes it a real beast to, um, this is one of the reasons why we don't have a vaccine against this bacteria. And it also makes it more difficult for drug development. But so the immune response, uh, it mounts a response against the antigens or the proteins that it initially detects. It goes through all that trouble to get a really robust immune response. And then the bug changes its game plan. That immune response is considered or rendered useless. This tricking can be you know, switching gears from one predominant immune target to another. It can change it all together. It can fold in on itself if it's a, an envelope or a capsule so that the immune system sees different targets. Envelope viruses are notorious for that. Um, but then even in the example I'll say of HIV, which just all together changes literally the way and mutates the way that the virus looks. Um, so really cool, smart activities on behalf of these pathogens. And, and you kind of have to admire the, the art there that they can accomplish. All right, we're gonna fast forward past these that I already talked about. Um, and let's do this one. Okay, this whole notion of viral infections, um, it's a careful balance. Remember we talked about that viruses are obligate intracellular hosts. They require a host cell for survival, but they spread by killing its host. Now that's kind of weird, right? Um, viruses have molecules on their surface that can trick entry into a cell and then they go and kill that cell. Um, they can directly kill immune cells like HIV. They can persist within cells and prevent that cell from notifying the immune system. Viruses have a number of really cool, unique uh, um, virulence factors. You can think of viruses as falling into two camps. When we consider them in this sort of basic form, they're gonna either be lytic or lysogenic. A lytic cell, lyses, a lytic virus lyses its cells like SARS-CoV-2. Um, and, and then they're going to kill one cell and move on to the next. And eventually they're going to burn it out and you run the risk of actually killing the host. You have a lysogenic cell where they invade the cell, but then they incorporate themselves into that cell somehow, usually into the host chromosome, and then they hang out for a while. DNA viruses are, are this is really common, but HIV does this so well because it has an enzyme that helps change its RNA into DNA so that it can then persist in the host cell. The kicker with the lysogenic virus is it's kind of like basic physics, what goes up must come down. Well, what goes in must come out at some point. So at some point it's gonna shift over into a lytic phase and it will end up lysing that cell in the long run in order to spread to other cells. Okay, we've talked about virulence factors that can help a bug spread within a host. I wanna think on a grander scale. How about the spread among multiple hosts? You know, we think or use the phrase disease spread, but is that really what we're spreading? Not really, we're, we're spreading the bug. The bug is causing disease, but that's just common nomenclature. We also get into a little bit of a gray area here with microbiology fading into epidemiology. In the academic sense, these guys don't always sit at the same lunch table, but in clinical care, in public health, that gray area is important. To ignore it means to ignore our understanding of how infectious substances spread and they can wreak havoc on a population. And we may not fully understand then how to get rid of them. So still playing with some of this vocabulary, these are terms that tend to be used interchangeably and incorrectly. 
Um, so since pandemic is now mainstream vocabulary, my kindergartner even uses it. I thought it might be helpful to kind of touch base on these a little bit. So we've got um, sporadic, endemic, epidemic, and pandemic. And we're talking about the degree with which um, uh, disease can spread within a population. Okay. So first up is sporadic. This is a disease or infection that occurs occasionally within a defined population, a defined time frame or a geographic location. Um, we use the term outbreak to kind of talk about this one. A good example might be the um, a sporadic disease might be Norwalk virus on a cruise ship. Endemic disease is disease that's always present within a population, maybe at varying levels. Um, think about malaria in North Africa. Um, how about an epidemic? You can think of it this as a larger or smaller context. The smaller context might be, say, the spread of drug-resistant gonorrhea among teenagers in high schools in a four-state area. We still have a defined population, a time frame, um, a, a geographic area, but it's on a broader scale than, than just a sporadic disease. You can take that up a notch. What about the spread of SARS in Asia between 2002-2003? Bigger than an outbreak, but we got we covered a large area. And then, of course, pandemic spread, where we spread across the world. And obviously, the most obvious example of that would be with, um, with the spread of COVID. Okay, I have talked a ton. You have to be tired of listening to me. I want to play a little game, all right? I did not get a good response, you guys, on the chat box, but you guys really came with it on the polls. I am going to be asking you to use your chat, I mean, your Zoom functions a little bit. So if you go up to the top, usually it's along the top better, we're gonna look for that annotate function. It's gonna have a little pencil on it, right? And so you're gonna click that annotate function. I'm gonna give you a, a, the next slide. I'm gonna ask you some questions and I want you to populate your responses to those questions by stamping or drawing or doing a check mark. Let's get, get creative, whatever you wanna do. And then Courtney will help me clear those out. Okay, everybody ready? Let's see if we can make this work. Um, so I'm gonna give the question and then you use your annotate function to try and mark what you think is the right answer. How about the worldwide spread of H5N1 during 2009? What do we think? Oh, look, it works, this is so fun. Okay. We've got some that are hitting epidemic, some that are hitting pandemic, some that are moving their answer. You guys are being, you know, peer pressure here. So the key here is worldwide spread, right? So we would call that a pandemic. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't give you the obvious example of, of COVID. All right, let's try again. Let's try again. Um, let's say the spread of Ebola. Oh, can you help me clear those out, Courtney? Maybe I can do it. Oh, I did it. Ha! Or maybe you did it. I did it first. All right. Um, how about the spread of Ebola in Western Africa between 2013 and 2016? Is that endemic, epidemic? Awesome. I think it's interesting. We've got some people choosing endemic and they're like, dude, Ebola is always there. That's, that's actually you know, kind of true. Um, but this would have been called an epidemic. And note that um, Sometimes that was considered an Ebola outbreak. We have Ebola outbreaks over large areas. And that just goes to show that sometimes that word outbreak can be used interchangeably between sporadic and epidemic disease, but technically it would fall under sporadic. Okay, um, a cholera outbreak in Haiti after the 10, 2010 earthquake. What do we think? Oh wait, I gotta clear the drive. Okay, 2010 earthquake, we had a cholera outbreak. What, ex what type of disease would this be? Disease spread, love it. Bobby Joe there with the lead. Yours popped up first. Oh, everybody's getting this one right. Okay, let's move on. Now, whether you know the answer or not, you may be using your serious powers of deductive reasoning, but how about steady state levels of Chagas disease? This is a parasitic vector-borne disease in Latin America. Steady state levels of Chagas disease in Latin America. Right, that's one of those where it's just always there, to, maybe even to varying levels. Perfect, you guys did great. And you're one of my first times I've gotten to use this function. So that was pretty cool. Um, let's see, we are going to move along just a little bit here. All right, 
We talked about disease spread in some really big context. I want to drill down, think about it more on the patient and the person level. And so that means we need to think about res reservoirs. Reservoirs of infection, meaning that's something that's always there. It's a continual source for microorganisms. And when we're thinking about this, we're, we're done thinking about friendly bugs. These are, these are the bad bugs. Um, I can't seem to think about reservoirs without thinking about Mary Mallon. She was also known as Typhoid Mary. Um, in the early 1900s, she was responsible for infecting over 50 people and killing at least five. And the whole time she said it wasn't me, um, she was forcibly quarantined twice. I encourage you to read about her story. It is fascinating. But reservoirs can be living or inanimate. Um, and we're going to walk through some of these. Um, so we think about uh, living reservoirs. How about animal reservoirs? If you get something from an animal, that means it's a zoonotic reservoir. Diseases that occur primarily in wild and domestic animals that can be transmitted to humans, like Lyme disease, rabies. We also think about a lot of our respiratory viruses or zoonotic transfers. You've got non-living reservoirs like soil and water. I gave the example even a cooling tower for Legionella, but the whole classic rusty nail from tetanus, the disgusting water source for cholera. These are all types of reservoirs for the inf uh, these infections. And I don't wanna discount the presence of soil. Whole lot, whole lot going on in a soil. So how disease or the microorganism that's causing it can be bucketed. We can look at it as either contact versus vehicle transmission, and both are at play in a hospital or clinical setting. Contact transmission, something we can easily relate to. If it's direct, that's person to person. Kissing, droplet transmission, which is gross. Um, intercourse, all of those, um, you know, sneezing, indirect contact is also considered in this grouping. Um, if the transmission uh, is coming from a reservoir to a host through a non-living object, like a fomite, um, a fomite is any non-living object that can be involved in disease spread. Tissues, bed rails, stethoscopes, doorknobs, computer things, um, computer things, computer keyboards, uh, the bottom of a woman's purse, swab that, it's disgusting. Um, if it's the case of a vehicle transmission, then it has to be transmitted through some sort of medium, a middleman, so to speak. Foodborne illness is going to be the food that you ate, like that contaminated omelet from Denny's that laid me low. Sorry, Denny's. Um, but contaminated blood supplies, contaminated water supplies. But here's where we get vectors into play. I have see that picture of, a, of the mosquito. Um, you know, like a tick, a mosquito, any other type of insect, um, they're the most commonly encountered vectors. And vector transmission could be through a simple mechanical transfer, um, it could, like a fly with nasty stuff sitting on your food on its legs, or through a biological transfer. It's going to bite you. It's going to defecate, vomit, grind it into the bite. Gross, but that is how it happens. Um, when we look at transmission in a hospital setting, the reservoirs, the ways microbes are passed, and I'm bringing this up because we have several clinicians, um, the ways that the microbes are passed and transmitted, it gets really complicated. And sometimes it's not the obvious answer. Everybody's like, duh, a doorknob. But it isn't always that simple. And, and I wanted to raise this, this example. Um, this is an image of one of my fellows pulling apart an operating room uh, heating cooling device. It's used in a cardiac bypass procedure. It warms the circulated blood. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut to the cliffhanger and tell you that they were out in the field looking into a, a cluster of non-tuberculoid mycobacterium cases in cardiac patients. And after a great deal of sampling and field work, they find out that it's these units. They were aerosolizing bacteria during the procedure. And of course, naturally, the exhausted vent was inadvertently facing the patient. But what was happening is deep down in this, there was a biofilm in this equipment. And again, everybody can wipe down a bed rail. We know we're going to wash hands. It reduces the risk of HAIs um, you know, substantially. But this is what we want to think about when we think about means and reservoirs of infection. And when we're in a clinical setting, in a hospital setting, it gets just a little bit more complex. All right, we are running short on time. So I'm going to take one activity out and I'm going to go to this one. So do me a favor, go to your other device. We're almost at the end. Go to menti.com and enter the code that you see here. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to share to a different screen.
But everybody head over that way. And what I'd like you to do is using short or single word responses, because we're going to build a word cloud, share some ways or things that things that we can do to help prevent or stop the spread of microbial disease. And you can enter up to three. So we've talked about the basics of bugs. We've talked about virulence factors. Um, we've talked about host defense factors. Um, I just want to confirm, Courtney, you can see the screen that has menti.com on it. Okay, great. All right, don't be shy, guys. Type in your responses. This only works and it's cute unless you put stuff in. Um, ideally, I would like now for us to kind of bring this and pull this all together because we've talked about the bugs. We've talked about how they can spread. We can talk about how you know our bodies kind of fall down on the job from keeping us protected. But in the grand scheme of things, what are ways that we can do, what are things that we can do to help prevent or stop the spread of microbial disease? Does anybody have any suggestions? Oh my goodness, here we go. Yay, it's coming. This is what's fun. Sneeze and elbows, wash hands, absolutely. That is the number one way. I love the inclusion of educate, my goodness. Something that we took for granted with this whole COVID is that we weren't educating, we weren't communicating. Excellent hygiene, disinfect, testing animals. Awesome. Sneezing in the elbows, we call that the Dracula. Mask up, I love it. I can't wait to see how long that kind of sticks around. Cleanliness, sanitation. Great, I see masks a lot. And I think it'll be interesting to see how long and to what degree the mask wearing practice um, for, uh, continues because I don't know about you guys, but my kids had a lot less colds. We got a lot less tummy upset. I mean, it's, it can be really effective. Okay, we are almost out of time. I forgot to ask Courtney if she was gonna do an introduction. So um, she even said, please feel free to stay. I have one last slide. You may be able to hear my dog yelling at me about something going on outside. Um, there we go. Let's move this back over here. And then I just wanna kind of round out with this. Um, these are something that we talked about hand hygiene, something vaccination, right? You know, I know we all have different beliefs on that, but it stops the spread of disease. Um, there was a lot of discussion about um, education and increased awareness about healthy practices. That's great. What about detection? We overlook that. What about continuing our science and knowing and understanding what these bugs look like? We, I went through a whole lot of trouble to talk about all the differences and the nuances and how we could exploit that to identify and treat. If you can detect something and you can treat it, now granted that didn't apply here to COVID, but the spread of STDs, right? We stop that spread with detect and treat programs. Um, antibiotic stewardship. We can't reduce the spread of something unless we can treat it. And we can't treat it unless our drugs work. So thinking about antibiotic resistance. But you guys brought up some great ones. Okay, that is gonna bring me to the end. I talked your ears off. I hope I, hope I was successful with giving you and you walk away with at least two things that you learned and are like, hey, that's pretty neat. But I think that we've hit some high points on some pretty complex learning objectives. Um, with that, I will stop sharing. I told, um, I told Courtney that I'd be happy to stick around uh, if there are any questions, but it, we are at 401. So my feelings will not be hurt if you have to jump off. So um, if you guys do have questions, since there's not that many of us, um, yeah. feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, if you feel more comfortable typing it in the chat box, you can do that as well. We can stay on a few more minutes in case somebody does have questions. I see Heather had that question about a better understanding of biology disease. Hopefully you got that. Oh, flu season is going to be really bad. What are your thoughts? I'm not the right person to ask. Um, I don't know, but I do find it fascinating. Get vaccinated. Well, while we're waiting, um, in case people are thinking of questions or typing in the chat box, I want to remind everyone, um, once this is over, you will receive an email that has a sign out in it. You please remember to click that sign out link and complete the um, small survey afterwards to make sure you receive your CE credits. 
Um, if you have any questions about the CE credits, please feel free to email me and I will do my best to answer. Those are direct you to ASU who is helping us provide CE credits for this webinar. Um, the presentation recording will be shared along with the slides. Um, give us a few days to get them posted um, on YouTube, we post the recording and then we'll have the recording and the slide link um, on our website. Um, it usually takes us a few days um, to get those up and running. You guys did great on your little stamps, by the way. That was fun. Um, if you guys think of questions after the webinar, please let me know and we can get those answers for you as well. Um, it looks like there might not be any questions. So okay. I do want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon and spending um, some time with us. Um, please be on the lookout for the future learning community webinars we have coming up in August and September. Those will also have um, CE credits offered as well. Um, I hope you all have a good day. And again, thank you for joining us. Bye everyone. Bye.